From this morning's gospel, John chapter 1. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Have you ever lost a Christmas gift in the midst of all the wrappings? One particular Christmas when our children were still quite young, we just let them tear into their presents. Paper, ribbons, bow were strewn all over the living room. You had to be careful where you stepped because you couldn't see the floor or anything on the floor due to everything littering the carpet. And it wasn't long until one child said they were missing one of their presents and began accusing their siblings of taking it. Chaos ensued until we made everyone stop and pick up the mess and throw it all in the garbage bag. And it was about then that that missing present was found and the child sheepishly acknowledged that perhaps they had overreacted once again. Now the present hadn't been taken, it really hadn't been lost. It just simply got buried under the mess of all the uh, wrappings. The things that most people think about Christmas time can also be like losing a gift in the midst of all the wrapping paper. I mean, most people think of Christmas as a time for giving, and indeed, the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas usually finds people in their most charitable mood. Giving trees find, have us buying gifts for strangers we don't know, simply so they'll have something. Those Salvation Army kettles outside the retail stores clang with the sound of chain dropping into them, accompanied with a hearty Merry Christmas. Or people think of Christmas as a time of peace and harmony among men, beckoning the words of the angelic chorus, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, while of course forgetting the beginning words of glory to God in the highest. We sometimes celebrate the attributes ascribed to the holiday without acknowledging the reason for the season, forgetting that without Christ there is no Christmas. Too often the gift of Jesus and his salvation is lost in the wrappings surrounding his birthday. Churches that were brimming with festive carolers last night sit bare this morning. After all, we have parties to recover from, meals to prepare, and family gatherings to attend to. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. While Matthew and Luke recount the story of the Christ child's conception, incarnation, and birth into the world of men, it is St. John the Beloved who answers the good Lutheran question, what does this mean? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Before sweet baby Jesus drew his first breath in Bethlehem's bear, stable bear, the Christ was with God from the very beginning. He was the power of creation. After all, the formula of creation was what? And God said, let there be, and there was. God used words, and when he spoke, the word made things happen. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John gives us clarity about the who of this word when he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the only son from the father full of grace and truth. Baby Jesus, the Christ child, didn't come filled with Christmas cheer or full of glad tidings. That's the response of the angel chorus to his birth. No, the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. John's use of those words, grace and truth, is unique to his gospel account. Now, the other evangelists also use both words, but John uses them extensively and explicitly. 
Grace is taken from the Greek charis, and it is defined as God's undeserved, unconditional, and unlimited love that seeks the salvation of sinful humankind. And while there are those who try to explain grace as being a source for people to use in order to obey God or to better themselves, that's not the way grace is used in the Bible. Grace belongs to God. It emanates from him. Grace is a God thing that moves him to love the unlovable and save sinners that most would not consider worth saving. We receive grace. We are blessed by grace. But grace is solely an attribute of God from which we are given forgiveness of sins, salvation, and eternal life. The word was made flesh. The incarnate Christ child was born full of grace. He is full of grace and truth. Truth taken from the Greek atheis, which denotes the truth as opposed to falsehoods. It's as if John were saying, hey, forget everything about what others have said about God. You just need to listen to what he has to say. Oh, by the way, Jesus is God. This reflects the point of this morning's epistle reading from Hebrew 1. Long ago at many times and many places, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed to the, be heir of all things and through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his na nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Jesus is not just a truth, but the truth. God the Son. That's what John is getting at when he writes, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And this correlates directly to what the prophet Isaiah says in today's Old Testament reading. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And while both grace and truth are important, John highlights God's grace in Jesus, saying, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. While Jesus is full of grace and truth, from him the sinful children of men receive grace upon grace. This phrase, grace upon grace, is like standing on a beach, watching the waves come in. A wave breaks upon the shore followed by another and still another. God's grace is given, is received, and is given and received again and again. God's unconditional, unlimited, and undeserved love, which he gives in spite of our unworthiness, never ends. We use some, and more takes its place for us to use yet another time. It is there to comfort us when we hurt. It forgives us when we sin. It relieves us when we feel guilty. It supports us when we're afraid. It gives everything to us who can give nothing to earn it or repay it. God's love is so great that the eternal word became flesh and sacrificed himself on the cross for us. Jesus gives us grace upon grace, piling God's love on us more and more, higher and higher, wave upon wave upon wave. As Luther notes, Christ is an interminable well, the chief source of grace, truth, righteousness, wisdom, and life, without limit, measure, or end. And even if the whole world were to draw from this fountain enough grace and truth to transform all people into angels, still it would not lose as much as a drop. This fountain constantly overflows with sure, sheer grace. Jesus is God's yes to fallen mankind, even as Paul tells the Corinthians, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. For the law was given through Moses, John says. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John establishes a contrast of intensity rather than one of quality. He's not saying that the law is less important, for indeed it too is God's word to us. God gave the law to us through his servant Moses, and God's law is still important for humankind to understand. 
It burrows itself deep into our consciences, curbing the sinful desires and impulses that bring misery and ruin. It reflects to us our own sinfulness and our need for a savior. The law shows our need for God's grace and mercy so that our hearts are opened and yearning for the gospel of Jesus' grace and truth. The instruction of the law prepares the way for the gospel so that grace upon grace may come over us, comforting, relieving, forgiving, supporting, giving us what we could never accomplish or find within ourselves without God's blessing. We know God's grace and glory because Jesus has made him known. Our Christmas celebrations will wind down and come to an end. We will clear all the wrapping paper, ribbons, and bows that litter the floor, perhaps discovering some things we thought we had lost. We'll eat our leftovers and we'll turn our attentions toward the coming new year. And all these aspects of our Christmas will run their course until we do it all over again next year. But the real gift and truth, the reason for the season, and the meaning of Jesus' entry into our world full of grace and truth carries on. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, something the world can neither give nor take away, something for which we are all most thankful. And so, thank you, sweet baby Jesus, for all that you are and for all that you give. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen.